Welcome to the Answers Yes podcast, where we interview some of the most interesting people that have said yes to opportunities in their life. We hope that through these stories, you can learn to create your own destiny by saying yes along the way. Join us as we explore the new series covering topics such as passion, integrity, and hard work. I'm your host, Jim Riley, and I hope you enjoy these interviews as much as I do. I believe that everyone has an important message worth hearing. Hello and welcome back to the show. The answer is yes. You know, I just, again, I'm always so grateful for the comments and the feedback that we've received. We're well past 60,000 subscribers and on our way to my next big goal, which is 100,000. We've been after the show for about three years. And, you know, it's been a lot of fun. I've met some incredible people over the last few years that now I call friends. And what's interesting is it's getting a little bit easier to book guests. <laughs> People realize that we've got some sustainable sustainable power here on the show, and, and I've just been so grateful for that. And because of those relationships, I've met wonderful people uh, like Alex, who was on my show, um, I don't know, it's almost been a year, and Alex is a ninja warrior, and you'll see him running around, but he's introduced me to some of his friends, and today I've got Nate Burkhalter on the line. Good morning, buddy. How you doing? Hey, good morning, Jim. Doing great. I glad to be a part of this and glad we got our mutual friend, Alex Weber. Yeah, yeah. He's he's such a great guy. I talk to him, check in with him once every couple of weeks, and uh, he's doing the deal, you know, and and uh, I can see you've got your Ninja Warrior shirt on and, and love that you're... <laughs> Ninja Warrior Camp. Yeah, I just got to lead a camp. I'm traveling all over the country right now. So led a camp of kids and teens the past week. Yeah. So they made us a custom shirt. Don't show Ninja Warrior this logo. They might have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let it slide. We're, we're not recording the video, so you're going to be good today. Depends on where you go from here, you know. Uh, right. Look, I, I followed your success and, you know, your career online, but for my listeners, can you give us a recap of, you know, how you got involved in, you know, athletics and where that started, whether that was in school or your parents' influence or friends, what have you, but where did things start for you in life? Yeah, so you may give a little bio intro, but if not, I'll give a quick recap and say that I've been an American Ninja Warrior competitor on NBC for seven years national finalist twice, and then won another TV show that combines Survivor and American Ninja Warrior, which was lasted about seven months, and that was in Latin America. It was a cool different, different format, but very similar to Ninja Warrior. But growing up, and my background wasn't in obstacle course racing. It was more around in high school, got into tennis, and college was football. But before then, I was your below average athlete, or I wouldn't consider myself an athlete at all other than my dad throwing the football to us as kids and scrambling around the yard. But I had two younger brothers who were five and 10 years younger than me. So it was easy to, to, you know, outrun them or push them around. So I, I, I was the kid out in the left field in fifth grade as the left fielder playing baseball and sitting there picking flowers and weeds and roaming around and the ball would be hit to me and the coaches would yell at me and I'd realize, Oh, there's the ball. And you kind of wander over there and get it. I was not your most, aggressive impressive athlete but i think it, it slowly morphed and blossomed by the time i got into high school and at home school at times started seeing that you know i enjoy some kind of competition and i'd love to to use that what can i do here well i'm 115 pounds so opportunity for football doesn't look that great which was the thing that i i liked just because my dad was a big college football fan he went to auburn university and got to see bo jackson play when he was in school and bo jackson being a phenomenal athlete one of the world's greatest athletes. We grew up kind of watching highlights of him. So I thought the football idea would be awesome, but too small to do that, at least by the coach's standards and a few other things. So mm-hmm. I, I said, well, what's my opportunity? And I guess tennis is the only thing I got because in South Louisiana, there's no competition for that. Everyone thinks it's a dumb sport, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> jo- jokes on them because the girls were really pretty. So uh, I was like, football team, you got to practice on your own, but we get to practice with the girls. Hey, not so bad. But got into that, and then when I got to college, I started pursuing an engineering track, but also understood how to better discipline and exercise my body. So I started eating and lifting weights in a different way, put on about 60 pounds of muscle, and became formidable in size at six foot 195. Started working out with the football team and eventually went through the process of walking on to the football team at Louisiana Tech University. That was cut short by 
a severe burn, second and third degree burn on all of my legs, kind of a freak accident that happened outside of football, but put me in a wheelchair for a while and I lost a lot of weight. So I, I pivoted and focused on finishing up my engineering career or my engineering um, schooling, graduated in 2010 and then moved to Houston, Texas, started working for ExxonMobil, a big oil and gas firm that was more or less based in Houston. And then that took me around the world. So the the next part of what, how we're known is the Ninja Warrior component, which is, you know, maybe two years into life in Houston, I had gotten out of sports and athletics, you know, didn't make my dream of college football and was just plodding along in a, a career path where I was finding success, at least financially and, and in business management, but I didn't have a lot of purpose in life and I was looking for coping mechanisms and, you know, happy hours and like, what am I doing exactly? So I had a, a real crisis of faith, realizing I was I was raised with a, a a good foundation of, I'd say, biblical faith because my dad was a Southern Baptist preacher, but I also saw a lot of brokenness and poverty and, you know, the religious things that most of us in the U.S. or in the South we've grown up seeing the pros and cons of some of that. So I saw a lot of the cons, and I was like, my dad's a man of faith and value, but the people around us, I wasn't really impressed with their life. So I don't know if there's a solution there or an answer there. So I kind of went on this early life crisis, searching around the world for some um, meaning in life, and eventually, you know, got grounded in my faith and and met Jesus in a way that really changed who I was and what I believed, and that shifted my perspective in life. It also changed my identity. Now being one who has a foundation of being a child of God, and no longer having to pursue things in this world to define me. It, my identity shifted where I, I can now take a bigger risk and try something new and really separate myself from success or failure by my my perspective, which I was a big people pleaser. Alex Weber will, will state the same thing. <laughs> and I was very concerned about what people thought of me and how I needed to appear. And if I tried something new, I wanted to be sure that I was going to be successful at that. And if I had a, a potential to not do it well, then I'd never attempt it. Well, the problem for me is I was a below average athlete. So that led me to anything I dab my toe in. I started off below average and that immediately meant failure and embarrassment if I was defining myself by those, those success failure standards. So I wouldn't try anything or I try the way beneath me type thing. You know, let me go into the easy tennis route where there's no competition instead of going for the football team where I'm gonna have to start at the bottom and work my way up. As my identity changed, I realized, hey, it's worth it for me to to go for something that's seems exciting or seems like a dream and not worry about the failure because my identity is now in a new place where it's not about those things. It's about me being able to step forward in faith and see what's going to happen. So uh, American Ninja Warrior came to me in that season by a friend sending me a text message and it became an opportunity. And just like I'd said yes to some opportunities in my career path where they said, hey, we got a opportunity for you. <laughs> Which, you know what that means in the career world. You're like, oh, no. Yeah. Like, hey, we got a we got a spot in Bakersfield, California that we really need some some workers out there on the engineering side. Can you start taking some of those assignments? And everyone in our, our engineering team was like, nope, 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 nope. I was the only one that was like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Because I was in a place of, let me make the most of an opportunity, even if it looks like hard work and not a lot of fun. But that brought me to getting to to take a cool advancement in my career and then got me into some other really cool places where eventually I got to work in Santa Barbara, California, which is much more beautiful than than Bakersfield. Oh yeah. The same thing in the in the athletic world. I saw an opportunity and I said, you know, I, I'd love to live in a place of living with a potential failure instead of living with regret. Because I've lived with a lot of regret where I was too afraid to take a step or a leap of faith. And I realized the way that I'm wired and I work, like I said, as a below average athlete, when I start getting into it and, and getting some reps and learning and growing, I really begin to grow. And all of a sudden, I've seen, to some degree, like the cream rising to the top. And I, I came into ExxonMobil below average, if you want to call it that. I didn't have a high pedigree. You know, we had guys from Harvard and Yale and Texas A&M and impressive universities around the U.S. And I was a guy from Louisiana Tech University, which is a small country school. And I was a country guy, worked on farms construction, things like that. So I didn't have this impressive pedigree, but getting into that big organization, as I apply consistency, as I learn from others, as I 
tried and looked for the opportunity, I began to rise through the ranks and up in the ranking program and eventually climbed towards the top, which opened up incredible opportunities to live overseas in Africa and in Norway and work incredible projects with, you know, tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars that we were managing and became quite exciting. But that all came through not taking on the perspective of comparing myself to others or worried about, um, I'm not going to be great at this, so I'm never going to try. Just went in with the learning mindset and how that can be fun. So that translated into Ninja Warrior. As I said, you know what, I'm going to, I know this can be a big public way to fail, but it's also a great way for me to exercise being uncomfortable and stepping out and not living with regret, but letting, letting failure be a way of, of fueling me forward. So I, I applied, got rejected, did a walk-on process year one, did okay, but didn't move on past the first round. And then next year got more excited. And I'm like, oh, I know what to do now. I made an even better video, applied again, and they rejected me again. I was, I was quite disheartening. And I'd been, this is back when Facebook and, and most social media was still popular in that realm. So I'm talking about it online, which I didn't like to do. I was like, I'm gonna try for the show. And then everyone's excited. You're gonna make it, it's gonna be awesome. And then they don't pick you. And you got to go back and make an update and let them know. So that was discouraging, but also reminds me to double down. And, and if I had never dipped my toe in that water, I'd never had the chance to experience that setback and then say, man, we can make this thing a setup for a comeback if I don't give up. And that's the reminder for, for those of y'all listening. You know that without adversity, we rarely are going to accomplish something of significance or, or of value. So it's good to have that resistance in our life and, and use that to be an activator. Use that adversity to be an activator, not to be the discouragement of why you don't try or why you don't keep going. So year three, I'm living in Africa, and that's when I applied for the third time and, and thought about how do I make a, a change right now instead of repeating the same thing, you know, the definition of insanity, repeating the same thing and expecting a different result. Why don't I modify a little bit about how I present myself, how I audition, how I go about this process. And so I got a little more well-rounded and didn't focus just on the athletics, but focused on a story and on communication and showing more of my personality, which didn't come off in video because I was terrified of being on camera and speaking in front of people. But in person to person, I'm pretty charismatic and fun and engaging. So when I changed the way that I made that audition video and talked about some mission work I've been doing in Africa and in, in Central America, drilling water wells, for communities in need, they picked up on the story and thought it was great and immediately called me and said, hey, we want to want to accept you this year. We've seen you the past couple of years, but now you also have a story that we can work with. And boom, I was on, ended up making it through the first round and hitting my first buzzer on Ninja Warrior and getting a big TV feature. And that opened the door for beginning to step out and speak and share on my story and that journey on the career path, on my walk of faith. And so it began opening up new a new uh, potential in my mind of what I could do in life. And that eventually set the stage for me to walk away from my career, which I did in 2019 after about five years overseas. And it paralleled a lot of setbacks with Ninja Warrior, you know, making it to the national finals in my third year, but then breaking my ankle the night before and still trying to run the course with a, a fractured ankle, wearing a, a bunch of tape and a boot and a lot of ibuprofen, <laughs> you know, you never with Ninja Warrior, you never know if you'll ever get another opportunity. It's rare for you to get accepted. And if you get accepted, uh, it's really tough to perform because you don't get to try anything beforehand. You can't see the obstacles. It's it's often filmed all through the night. So you may run it at 2 a.m. So it's tough to have a peak performance. And then even if you do well, rarely will you get shown. So many people have been on the show and never been put on TV. It's usually 25 to 30 percent of the competitors will get put on tv so for something to come out of it is rare so I, I knew that hey if i made it to this national final spot one that's really tough to do physically but then to ever get the chance to even get back on is rare so i better make the most of this and i i went for it, it didn't work out well but it also set the tone to say hey you know while that hurt a little bit my ankle healed up in the same way it would have without that and it, and it was worth it to push through a little bit of that pain and that set the stage for for future injuries that I not only overcame, but then competed through and ended up having some success. And so year six of Ninja Warrior was one where I contemplated quitting this thing because I hadn't had the success I was expecting or hoping for and, and seeing, hadn't made it back to the national finals. 
but also felt this stirring of you know, it's time for me to walk away from the the corporate security that I've been operating in, take a leap of faith and and jump out into the unknown because I'd I'd passed up some cool opportunities that presented themselves in the years past because I was I only had two or three weeks of vacation from my career and I didn't want to walk away from my career's financial security. Although I could sense that it wasn't my place of purpose and impact and calling, and it wasn't what God had really stirred in my heart to do. It was, it was more of my area of now playing it safe. Mm. So I, I wrestled with that for a few years. And finally, after making some financial preparations and a few other things, I was like, all right, I'm, I don't have it figured out. I don't know what I'm going to do, exactly, but I'm, it's time for me to jump out of this. So I made a leap of faith and resigned from that career in the spring of 2019, then got accepted to Ninja Warrior in my sixth year and ended up making it through the, the first and second rounds of the regionals onto the national finals. Finished up a trip in Africa. I was on a mission trip down in South Africa and flew back to Las Vegas for the national finals in June and beat the first round, which became, put you in, I, I wouldn't say legendary status, but that puts you in the elite level of, of Ninja Warrior. And they send us back that morning as we wrap up filming and say, be back here this evening. And I came down with this massive food poisoning sickness of puking my guts up and diarrhea and all the nine yards and probably lost 13 pounds of fluid. And I, I was over 12 hours. So they call me, the producers call me that evening and say, hey, you got to be up here for rule check for this next round, the final night, which is rounds two, three, and four, where you have one more aggressive obstacle course, then a really hard grip course. And the final one is climbing an 80 foot rope climb in 30 seconds. And if you do all that, you win the million dollar prize. Mm. And so I, I knew just back to the three years before when I had broken my ankle in the national finals and still decided I'm going to push through this and go for it. I realized, Hey, it took me three more years to get back to this place. And now I've done well and I've, I've made it past the first round. And I, I know I've trained and prepared well for this, but I feel terrible. I can barely stand up. I can't do a pull up. Do I want to quit now and hope that I can get back here next year? Or do I want to lay it all on the line, detach myself from the result and say, this is still an opportunity and I'm not going to pass it by because I may never get another one. And I don't live by a limited mindset or perspective. I believe we'll, we'll continue to get opportunities in life, but I do believe we can delay and miss opportunities. So it doesn't mean more won't come around, but there's still a time gap that passes. So I said, I'm going to do whatever I can. And they brought me over in a golf cart, hit me with an IV. So I got some fluids back in me sent me to the starting line and I had some friends come over and pray for me. I was like, well, I'm going to do whatever I can here, but I'll detach myself from results and expectations and just trust that this will at least be an encouragement to someone else, even if it's a big, ugly fail on the, the first obstacle. Long story short, ended up being a miracle run, one of the biggest runs of the night. And I, I get through this whole round with one second to spare on the time clock. And so it was a crazy buzzer beater. That was the only one of the season that, that played out like that. And it it kind of gave me a, an acceleration on a story of overcoming mm -hmm. and of looking at, at the obstacles as opportunity. And so that I thought, well, maybe that's a miracle that we'll continue on in the, the next round so that I can win this million dollar prize. And that didn't happen. But it did open the door a few months later for a TV show that I never heard of that called me and said, hey, we saw how you you've lived overseas and had an interesting life there. And we've seen how you persevered through sickness and injury. And we would love to ask you to come audition for our TV show. And that led me to eventually getting on to Latin America's most popular TV show called Exatlon. And that's on Telemundo. So it's in Spanish airing in the U S and in Latin America. And they had more viewers than uh, NBC's American Ninja Warrior and more popularity but we'd never heard of it because we don't speak Spanish. So that was, I led the door for a cool new opportunity that started in January, 2020 and ended up lasting them seven months. And we, we were detached from the world, no cell phone, no TV, no internet, no, no clothes or anything else we could bring in. They were handing us, we got two changes of clothes, which we competed in and parachute slept out in a shack in the woods. Wow. And it began the adventure of survivor meets American Ninja warrior all while being in prison to some degree. So that, that was a, that's a summation of a lot of my athletic journey and, and some of my career corporate background, but through the lens of, you know, how do you pursue or look at 
change your lens into seeing something as an opportunity, even if it looks like, I guess, pain, frustration, setback, or that's a job assignment I don't want, you know? Can I get the great stuff? Yeah, yeah. Nate, you, I mean, what an incredible story and, and recap of your life and the things that you've done. Some of the things that really stood out to me is your uh, discussion of faith, preparedness, and detaching yourself from results and expectations. And, you know, I don't know what your age is, but when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking you're coming from a very mature spot early in your career to make decisions, to place your career and your direction in faith. And uh, it's just incredible to hear you talk about all these things and how you you transitioned your re- relationship with the Lord and, and allowed that to become a focus for your decisions and where you went. Um, how much backlash have you seen from that? You know, friends, family, you know, onto your professional career. Um, and how tough is that? Because I, I know a lot of us struggle in our lives to really promote our faith. Yeah, great question. Well, it's it's been tougher as as of late with the way our world's gone, and you've been a big proponent of discussing a lot of the issues that our our country and our world are facing in the COVID crisis. That you know, I think most of us have a perspective that that was manufactured or used as a control agent or a change agent. And you know, faith faith can be controversial or it can be very benign. If you say, you know, I have faith, I'm spiritual, I, I believe in God, not very controversial. No one's going to really take issue with that. When you start standing up for certain values and getting more specific in, you know, for me, I, I made a change 10 years ago when I was in my, my mid-20s. I'm 36 now. That change was having that early life crisis and then thinking, man, I'm doing things on my terms and I'm not seeing it really work out, but if I've been told that I am, I am made by a creator and I have a purpose in life, well, <clears throat> as an engineer, I understand what it's like to design, create, build a, a sports car. I haven't done that by my own hands, but I've seen other engineers that have done that. And I know that that car is designed for a specific use and reason. And if I see somebody driving one of those Lamborghinis and they're dumping really low quality, low grade gasoline in it, and they're driving in an off-road and they're they're throwing some stuff on the top, like a couple of used mattresses to haul off to a garage sale. Like, man, this person is really blowing it on what the design and use of that vehicle was created for. But if you get back to the, the creator and ask them, you know, what, what was this thing made for? And you're like, this is made for a racetrack. And here's what it looks like. And here's the fuel you use. And here's the, the way you need a team to help work on this. And here's how you transport it. I mean, it, it, it changes the perspective and it allows that thing to function as created. Well, we were created for a unique purpose. One, in a generic sense, we're created to be connected to God, to know him, to glorify him, to have a relationship. And then more specifically, we have assignments that we were created to do and use. And if you tap into the creator and say, hey, what was what was my role? Then, then God will show you. And I've, I've seen that. So Matthew 6.33 says, seek first the kingdom of, of God and his righteousness, which just means God's way of doing things. It's a priority and order system. It says, then everything else will fall in place. And I've learned in life, it, it's it's tough to not focus on like the financial thing as the top priority or some kind of social status. Looking at the wrong thing leads us to make the wrong decisions and wrong priorities. And then things fall out of alignment because our foundation is off. So if I get back to the foundation of, man, I'm, I'm created by God. I'm here for a purpose and I don't know how to live this on my own. So I'm going to submit my life to a higher authority and follow those, that pathway and develop that relationship when I when I've done that, it's changed the the way I view this world, and it changed my security system. Realizing everything here on this earth, we can cling to it, we can grasp it, we can seek to control it immediately. And I've I've seen enough examples of people losing their life or losing their wealth or losing any number of things that they thought were their their sense of stability and security. And we can be deceived by thinking that we we have it all together when when it looks like we do. And COVID showed the world that some of that stuff can disappear overnight, especially in the realm of freedoms or in health for some people. So for me, even more recently, I've sought to live out my faith more and more in a in a bold way, but then in a a way of humility where I'm not trying to throw it in people's faces, but I, I want to 
utilize Matthew 5, 14 and 16. Jesus says, you're the light of the world. So let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. So if there's there's things in the way that I live my life and the attitude and the way I conduct myself, even if people disagree with it, like many did on this show in 2020, where they disagreed with my my stances on morality and the way that I, I made decisions, I, I sought to put others first, even if it hurt me in competition. And man, God glorified that in so many ways. And I won in miracle ways and won SUVs and won five and $10,000 cash prizes and ultimately won this championship despite breaking my ankle, despite almost breaking my neck and having two ruptured discs in my neck, despite partially tearing an Achilles, all these things that took out other competitors throughout the season and, and decisions I was making more in the, you would say moral sense where others were like, why are you doing that? You, you should, you should cheat the way we're trying to cheat or you should do this and that. And you're making us look bad. Like I'm not here to to be in a comparison state. I'm I know that my life is accountable to God, and so I'm going to live it in that way. And towards the end, they stopped mocking me and started going, "Man, this guy, he lives it." And God backs him up in that. That's incredible. And eventually, as I won, it, it won them over because as that was giving glory to God, they were like, "Man, this there's something to this. This guy is he's not a hypocrite. He's living it out, and God's showing up in his life." And that'd be my encouragement to all of you out there that you know, are hesitant to live out the values and the faith that you know to be real. If you if you step forward a little bit more in, in the public eye per se, at least just taking a stand in whatever your realm is, you're, you're gonna get some flack, some resistance. And me being a people pleaser, I don't I don't like that attention, but I'm not going to compromise just so I think people will quote unquote like me more or or not look at me negatively. So that recently came out with American Ninja Warriors stance in 2022 that all competitors have to be double vaccinated. And I, for numerous reasons, between already having COVID and being in the lowest health risk demographic and seeing how, regardless of vaccination status, this thing is still spreading, et cetera, et cetera. You've, you've covered numerous topics on that world. I decided that it wasn't in my best interest to accept that condition and compete this year. So I, I set out this season, which is tough because I had quit my career and now this is what I do for opportunities. So I was saying no to the, you know, the main opportunity I had. And while I am a proponent of taking advantage of all opportunities, I I also am a proponent of never compromising your value system and your morals. And for me, it was back to a trust issue. Do I trust that God has as a plan has direction for my life and is leading me here, or do I think that it's all on me and now I have to grab and seize every opportunity? You know, I don't, I don't have an only only fans account, although (laughs) I could as an opportunity, I don't know how it works exactly, but um, I know it's more female oriented in in that realm, but I'm not out creating and doing things that are outside of my, my filter system for my values, although they are opportunities. So there's a limit to, quote unquote opportunities. So for me, it became a a stand of like, this is where I'm not going to compromise, even though everyone's going to tell me I'm crazy. Like, well, you got to do what you got to do to use this as your opportunity, because that's that's how you generate income and opportunity, et cetera. And I was like, well, back in 2019, when I resigned from my, what was a fortune number one company with a 10 year career where I'd made a lot of money and climbed the ranks pretty high, those managers told me I was insane. Why in the world would you walk away from this? And it's like, well, one, I've realized the more money I make, the less it really gives me any sense of value and purpose. Now, I, I use that in good ways. I'm a good steward of my finances and investments and savings and giving. But I was like, this isn't what's what life is about. And so I, I told them I was feeling prompted by God to, to walk away and I'm going to take a leap of faith. And them being non-religious, as they would describe, they, they kind of laughed and scoffed and were like, what in the world? This guy's nuts. And I was like, well, this is where I feel convicted to go and I'm going to step out. And if I make a mistake, cool. It's going to be a way that I learn to more acutely hear the voice of God. I make that step away. And then I call my manager back up in the beginning of 2020 at January and say, dude, you won't believe it. This TV show I'd never heard of is is bringing me back on. It's going to pay me more than my engineering salary. And I got the chance for prizes and opportunities. He's like, okay, that's weird. Good luck. Well, we know what happens next. COVID hits, shuts down the world. When I finished this show up in August, I'm sorry, October 
of 2020, I call my manager back up and I'm like, you're never going to believe what happened. And he's like, you're never going to believe what happened. I'm like, well, okay, you go first. And he's like, well, I had to wipe out the entire division that I managed in our company. We had to let everyone go. There was no way to save people or transfer them to different parts of a company because everything had tanked because of the economy had crashed so hard. He's like, I would have had to let you go. And so I got the reminder of, wow, if I had played it safe and held held on to that thing that I, I felt it was time to let go of, it would have been taken from me anyway. And I would have had nothing else to do, no other opportunity right there. But instead, I, before even knowing that that situation was coming, I took that step of faith following God's prompting. And all of a sudden, I had an abundance of provision and promotion in an area that I felt called to. And so I told him, I was like, dude, I won two SUVs. I won a bunch of other cash <laughs> prizes and the $200,000 main prize from winning the entire show, among other things. And he's like, what? So his mind was blown seeing God moving that way. And, and it, again, he didn't have that paradigm. And I was like, hey, I, I didn't know this was coming in the world. I had no idea what this show could be. But I trusted and walked in faith in this way because I felt prompted to that. And he was like, man, there's there's something to that. So that that's a way to, you know, both live out in faith, but not so much an aggressive, controversial way of just, hey, my decisions are going to look different from yours. But eventually it's going to bear fruit and people are going to start looking back in hindsight and saying, man, that whatever he was thinking, whatever she was doing, that's working out for them. It, it doesn't mean we're without hardship in life. But eventually there becomes a track record of, wow, that 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 mindset that I disagree with, that thing I ridiculed them for. Like I still have people that put, messaged me yesterday or posted on my Instagram attacking me for making my decision where I, I made an announcement saying I'm going to sit this season out. Good luck to everyone that's there. I, I don't feel comfortable um, adhering to the, the mandates. And so I'm going to lose this opportunity, but I'm going to sit out. You know, it wasn't controversial. It wasn't me attacking anyone. Well, I had plenty of support on that, but I also had some people making some kind of ridiculous statements and attacking me like, well, you're an idiot, or you think vaccines are non-scientific, or apparently you've never traveled, or da 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 I'm like, well, I've actually traveled to 35 countries, and I've got 20 vaccines, a long list of an immunization record, and I'm also a fairly good critical thinker. That's mm -hmm. what made me a good engineer. So, cool. Thanks for the, your your input. <laughs> but uh, there's not a lot of relevance there in the things you're saying. Obviously, it's an emotional response. So I've learned to laugh at, at some of the attacks and, and just say, I'm doing what I'm called to do. And I've seen God continue to provide even without the, the quote unquote opportunity of American Ninja Warrior this season. Now, I hope it comes back around and changes and I get to be a part of it, just like Alex and many of our other friends. But if not, maybe something new will come around which is also something I'm working on right now. I love it. To create something new. Seeing seeing the the setback as an opportunity to create something newer, exciting, bigger, and better. We'll see where that goes. Nate, normally I, I bring people back to their story and I want to comment and dive into and dig into and all these other things. But, you know, I think the amount of value that you just brought to our listeners within your story and the lessons that you just told through your story are so valuable if people can just listen to what you've said, how you've made your decisions, your why, and your ability to stick by your why. Most often people will not follow the direction that you followed. And, you know, I got to say, I've, I've been a person of faith since I was six years old. I'm 54 now. But not until the last three or four years did I really proclaim publicly because I've got a big platform to say my values are God first, then family, then giving back, mm. then my health, right? Then time. And then the last thing on my list is business. Um, not until the last three, four years have I been doing that at that level. But you know what? My life has been so blessed. I've had the best four years of my life with my family, my faith, my friends, new friends. And you're living that life and you're proof of sticking by your beliefs and the strength of doing that and the benefits of doing that. So thank you for being so transparent with your your story, as well as your actions in a very, very public forum. The world needs more people like you. And I hope that the work that you're doing will encourage more people to be like you and make decisions like you've made. Thank you, Jim. 
that's an honor and it it's an encouragement it's also a reminder that i get inspired and encouraged when i see other people doing that because i can i receive and see and experience fear just like anyone else mm -hmm. so i have to choose courage because i'm not a i'm not a fearless person by any stretch i've dealt with a lot of fear so i decide hey so has other people when you're standing on the starting block at american ninja warrior wondering man, I, I'm about to trip and fall on this first thing. And, and I'm not being self-deprecating when I say that. There's a serious risk of it. And the fear, the overwhelming anxiety that hits, it almost feels paralyzing. And then I talk to other people that I've seen do it. And they're like, oh, I felt the same thing. So for those listening, just a reminder, you're, you're not alone when you feel these levels of fear, anxiety, but courage is choosing to take an action when feeling that that level of fear so it's it's still taking a little bit of an action and, and it gets easier and easier but the fear never goes away and so when i see and hear stories of other people who are doing it jim like yourself alex weber other friends we have then that encourages me to live in a bolder more authentic way and and realize there's always going to be naysayers but the riskiest thing we can do in life is play it safe mm -hmm. And I experienced that when I left my career path and my company. I've experienced it in other places when I have played it safe. And I'm not talking about taking a foolish risk. You know, don't drive down the highway 80 miles an hour without your seatbelt. I'm not talking about stupidity. But, you know, those places where this fear is speaking to us and you're never going to make it. But you also sense this is I've got to stand by my conviction. And, yeah, I'm going to walk through this airport without a mask on. Now that that may not be your conviction, but people are going to look at me funny. Or I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about my faith in something and I'm gonna people are gonna go, oh my gosh, and they're gonna roll their eyes and say something dumb. Well, I'd rather plant a seed and give a chance for that to marinate and germinate in someone in a way that they may open their eyes later and go, wow, you know, I, I disagree with this and that, but I I can't disagree with that person's conviction and the way that they they live their life, and I'm seeing results from that. And that's what prompts people to to make a change or to to see something. So I'm excited that I get that opportunity to do that, although it's it's challenging at times. It can be hard at times, but maybe to close, I want to remind everyone that life is hard. Life isn't fair. So don't look at it from a victim mentality. Look at it as, and life happens for me, not to me. And so if I think about life is hard, like it's, for me, it's hard to discipline myself to be in good shape, to work through injuries and setbacks. And when I don't feel like it, to, to exercise in a way that I have a good level of health, both for competition, but also just for doing normal things and living to be a, a, a you know, living a, a long life. But it's also hard to be unhealthy, to be overweight, to be sick, to struggle through life. At first, it may feel easy because it's easier to sit on the couch. It's easier to eat the very convenient, convenient cheap, fast food. It's easy at first, but then it becomes hard. So which hard do you want? The hard that yields results of feeling good, looking good and, and doing what you can or being limited. The same for marriage. You know, it's it's hard to have a good marriage. It's hard work. It takes intentionality, sacrifice, patience. But it's also hard being divorced or in my case, being single. I'm, I'm not married yet. And while it makes it, quote unquote, easier at times, I could be more selfish with my time because I don't have to worry about kids. But in the long run, that becomes a much harder path. And so that reminder for us to choose the hard, not look for the easy, because no matter what, it's going to be hard. It's, it's tough to manage wealth and have success in the financial realm, but it's also tough to be poor and broke and think about money constantly because you can't cover your next bill. And I've been on both sides of that equation. So I know that I'd rather choose the hard that nets the biggest um, good outcome and gives me the, the most flexibility or fulfillment in life. Mm. So that's the reminder for you guys. Choose your heart. And for me, it, it isn't, it's, it's tough. It's hard when I want to share my faith and be public about it. But so is hiding. So is cowering in your, your convictions. So is compromising. And then having that eat away at you and living with regret. And that doesn't change anyone's life. That doesn't bring a true new perspective where God can speak to someone. So don't cower. Have courage. Choose your heart. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. Where can we find you? If people want to follow your story, Instagram still a good place for you. Yeah, I'm I'm most active on Instagram. You can find me at No Limits Nate 
with an underscore at the end. And I, that's my same website, nolimitsnate.com. I'm working on a new sports competition that will combine a few different realms of Ninja Warrior and CrossFit and something else that can be exciting and fun. I'm working on a book right now and for the most part traveling the country doing events with Ninja Warrior and speaking and kids and teens and men's conferences, things of that nature. So thank you for letting me be a part of this, Jim. Thanks for letting me say hey to your audience. And I love what you're doing. You're an encouragement to me and to many others. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your convictions and your willingness to step out and be bold while knowing that you're going to take some fire and take some heat. I appreciate that so much. Thank you again for your time. We'll post up some show notes so you can follow Nate. And uh, I really encourage you to listen to this show a couple of times because there's a lot of nuggets in there that Nate has given us. Thank you for listening to today's show. It is my pleasure and honor to interview all of the guests that have been on the Answer is Yes podcast. If you have enjoyed the show, please go on iTunes and subscribe, give a rating, or simply tell a friend about the show. We also believe in the message of our guests and the positive influence of their stories. As my own mentor and coach, David Meltzer has taught me, spend some time every day thinking and writing about the things in your own life that you have more than enough of you will find out how blessed we really are. Please visit my website, livelifedriven.com for the latest updates about me and what I'm doing. Plus, I post a monthly blog about the many topics on this show. This podcast can also be found there. As I learned early on in life, what you believe is what you will achieve. Thanks, Mark Victor Hansen. And thank you and have a great week.